Hello and welcome to our presentation on textuality, cohesion and syntax. Textuality, welcome, cohesion to and. I could spring banana. Multiplication isn't moon, it. Or I could go on speaking to you using language in a sensible way. And really that's what this presentation is all about the sensible use of language. What makes language coherent? And a related question, what makes it cohesive? We'll discuss that distinction later. But first, I want us to look back at some ideas that were discussed in previous presentations in order to locate this topic in terms of the other things we've been exploring. So in a minute, I want you to consider a text um, taken from how to fly a kite, catch a fish, grow a flower. Actually, that's the title of it. Fly a kite, catch a fish, grow a flower. And it's cited in Bloor and Bloor's book, The Functional Analysis of English. So let's reflect on this passage not so much in terms of what it means, but in terms of what it reveals about what language means. Now that last phrase may sound a bit strange, language means. You might want to say language means what? But all this is saying is that language has a meaning function. Language means, that's its function. Or more accurately, a meta function, it's its meta function. A function that realizes other functions. Well, in past presentations, we've already mentioned two of M.A.K. Halliday's language metafunctions, so let's have a look at them. The ideational metafunction is basically the idea that language is used to organize, understand and express our perception of the world and our awareness of the world. So you can see this in a number of ways in the passage. For example, hooks are sharp, noise frightens the fish away. So these are examples um, of the experiential. They convey human experience. But the ideational function that Halliday, what Halliday calls the ideational function, isn't just restricted to the experiential, um, which is Another word for that might be just content or ideas. There's also the um, logical, that which is concerned with the um, relationship between ideas. So let's look at an example of that. Um, in the last sentence, the word since establishes a logical relationship in this case, the relationship of reason between the two main ideas in the sentence. So the ideational metafunction then has these two subfunctions: language's potential to mean ideas and content, and logical relationships between ideas and content. And it also has an interpersonal metafunction. Language allows us to participate in communicative acts with other people, to take on roles and to express and understand feelings, attitudes and judgments. So let's have a look at that in the passage. Notice that the writer, a man, reveals his attitude and shows that he is expressing an opinion through the use of modality. Ought to. Must be perhaps. So these are examples then of the of the interpersonal metafunction. The writer uh, in this passage is advising parents, the target audience, on how to teach their children to fish. The word perhaps indicates that his final point is merely a suggestion that we might reject it, but the earlier advice seems more urgent, ought to, must be. Now, I mentioned that the author was male, but you probably could have worked that out anyway. And, and note by his use of the pronoun his and fisherman, 
that he expects that the child learning to fish is a boy. Obviously, this has ideological implications, and it's the language that reveals them. Not that he is making his attitude explicit, he's simply presenting ideas as being representative of the world as he sees it. You could say that his ideology is hidden within the ideational framework. And of course, this, this itself has ideological implications that I'm not going to go into here. So is this, um, is this all there is to the story? Well, in this presentation, I'd like to reveal one more metafunction of language. And here it is, the textual metafunction. The textual metafunction is, is that aspect of language which allows us, which allows what is said or written to be related to the rest of what is said or written. In other words, then, language has a function of organizing itself, ways in which basically texts hang together as texts. And that is what this presentation is mostly going to be about. The um, textual metafunction is realized through the word order of the sentences. It probably went by without you even noticing this, but the message here is sequenced for the reader and the text is very coherent and cohesive. Um, for example, in the passage, notice the use of the words first, second, third and fourth. Numeral words used to signal the main points of the author's message. OK, so the, the textual metafunction of language then is to do with organisation. And sometimes this is referred to as textuality. So as well as realising an ideational and an interpersonal function, the two other functions, a text has textuality. And we're going to look more closely at this last function. And to do that, we're going to start by asking what may sound like a strange question. What is a text? Well, what would a linguist say? As you might expect, an excellent definition is provided by Halliday himself. A text is any passage of language, spoken or written, of whatever length that forms a unified whole. OK, so digest that. <laughs> but now we have to ask, well, what makes something unified? What provides the unity is texture. A text, as opposed to a non-text, has texture. Well, that's not too helpful. Um, <laughs> um, what exactly is texture? Well, let's, uh, let's explore this next. Imagine this exchange. What time is it, love? Julie left her car at the station today. Well, can you make sense of this? Um, what's the link between these two utterances besides their appearance in the sequence? So here's a possible scenario that, that might make the two uh, work together. Perhaps B has left his watch in Julie's car and so cannot tell A the time. So B is effectively saying, I can't tell you the time because as you know my watch is in the car and the car is at the station. What time is it, love? Julie left her car at the station today. So there's one idea. Uh, or perhaps both interactants are waiting for Julie, who is usually home at this time, but B can exp and uh, but B can explain why she's late. So A is basically asking for the time because it feels like it should be time for Julie to be home, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, I'm sure we could come up with several other possibilities to make these texts work together, unified, make them unified. So, um, what our sense-making efforts reveal is that language is essentially tied to linear sequence, whereby one part of a text, a sentence or a turn at talk, must follow another part of the text, the next sentence or turn at talk. 
and that each part of the text creates the context within which the next bit of the text is interpreted. We construct relationships between what is what is said or written now and what was said written a moment ago. And to put it in a, in a grand linguistic way, we can say that sense involves sequential implicativeness. <laughs> so what is texture? Texture is sequential implicativeness. I know Julie's late, but we shouldn't get worried because she left her car at the station today and caught the train instead of driving into work. Okay? The point of all this is if most texts are to make sense to readers or listeners, the links between the parts have to be easily recoverable. Making the links between the parts of a text recoverable is what the resources of texture enable language to do. So listen to these sequences of information. I'm going to give you two, and here's the first one. I'm from England. I've been here 20 years now. I don't really like it here. Okay, so three things here. I'm from England. I've been here 20 years now. I really like it here. Okay, here's the second. I'm from England. Cabbages are green. Is there a doctor in the house? Very different. The links between the three bits here seem much harder to make compared to the three bits of the first one. So let's look at some other examples of this. Read these two and ask yourself what makes for coherence or textuality. Once is enough famished, finally complete the survey when page two or bicycle, three apples, final basket, cox, five, leaf. Um, let's look at the first one. It seems that each clause is just grammatically incorrect. We can hardly make sense of each one, let alone how they hang together. So one obvious thing then we can say is that a text must be grammatically coherent. Let's have a look at the second one. Does this paragraph represent a complete unified event? I've been learning Spanish for two years. He's been playing basketball for five weeks. They've been checking out Chicago for two months. We've been working in Edgewood for three years. She's been studying astrophysics for six weeks. Not really. It's not a meaningful whole. The only commonality between the clauses is grammatical parallelism. A subject, a present continuous perfect aspect verbal group, either a direct object or an expression of location, followed by a prepositional phrase expressing duration. So one clue to non-textuality is the difficulty of identifying an actual communicative context in which a speaker or speakers could produce these clauses in sequence. And we could do that, you know, maybe they were part of some language learning materials or grammar game, but outside of that possibility, it's really hard to find a communicative context for this particular text. Well, <coughs> what is missing then is any kind of situational or contextual coherence. That is, the context that makes the paragraph meaningful. So as mentioned in the last presentation, we can recognize two levels um, of context. Context of situation, which is realized in the register of language, and context of culture, which is realized in its genres. Well, we can recognize two types of coherence that parallel these two levels. Um, situational coherence and generic coherence. I'll read this out, but I hope all the terms in it now are you know, reasonably familiar to us. A text has situational coherence when we can think of one situation in which all of the clauses of the text could occur, i.e. when we can specify a field, 
mode and tenor for the entire collection of clauses. And a text has generic coherence when we can recognize the text as an example of a particular genre. That is, when we can identify a schematic structure with each part of the text expressing one element in the unfolding staged organization of the language event. So let's look at this idea of generic coherence. Look at this text. Once upon a time, there was a little white mouse called Tiptoe. It's very rarely hot in Paris. When does the race start? It does so. No, I don't know how to make chocolate crackles. Of course, it's a very problematic text. But using our linguistic concepts, what can we say lacks? Well, it seems to lack situational coherence, basically. It's hard to think of a situation where all these sentences would occur. We seem to jump from the field of white mice to Paris to chocolate crackles. So it's not very, it doesn't have a coherence of field. Some clauses seem to be written language, others are responses from conversations. So it doesn't seem to have coherence of mode. Um, and we, we, we easily can't say what role the writer or the sayer of this paragraph is, is playing. Okay, so what about this one? Once upon a time, there was a little dog called Sam. The children lived in the woods in the most beautiful cottage you ever did see. That afternoon, the ogre was feeling very hungry again, but it was no use. George had not a penny left. So they ran and they ran and they ran until finally Old Mother Witch could no longer see them. That was some adventure, he mused. And so they never went on the underground train alone, ever again. OK, this is a bit different, isn't it? Though it's still a non-text, it is more text-like than the preceding examples. So why is this? What's going on here? Orientation. Um, a narrative is about to be told. It seems to have um, some generic um, co coherence. So uh, this should be familiar to us now. Um, genres have these 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 stages, and and um, typically with a narrative, we start with an orientation, and that's what we got in the text. Once upon a time, there was a little dog called Sam. Setting, uh, the time and place. The children lived in the woods in the most beautiful cottage you ever did see. We have a complicating action, events leading up to a climax. That afternoon, the ogre was feeling very hungry again. We have a climax, the pivotal moment. But it was no use. George had not a penny left. And we even had a resolution, how things get resolved. So they ran and they ran and they ran until finally Old Mother Witch could no longer see them. We have an evaluation, judgments and commentary on the story. That was some adventure, he mused. And we even have a coda, wrapping things up and pointing to uh, a moral or purpose. And so they never went on the underground train alone ever again. OK, still... So there's some generic coherence here, but the text is still lacking situational coherence. There just doesn't seem to be one story we're looking at here, but seven different ones. In other words, there is not one context in which all these sentences make sense as part of the same story. There is some cohesiveness uh, with the conjunctive relations between sentences, the but and so links. But participants keep changing. 
a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. Sam goes nowhere, and who is George? Okay. Incidentally, some writers deliberately introduce participants as though they were known to the reader, and the reader has to wait until later to piece the information together. But this is just a, a jumbled mess. So to sum up then, there are two kinds of contextual coherence that a text must have. Situational, um, um, situational coherence, or a, another term for this is coherence of register. So you know, when we can think of one situation in which all the clauses of the text could occur, i.e. When, when we can specify a field, a mode, and tenor for the entire collection of clauses, then it has coherence of register. And in Halliday's social linguistics, this is at the situational level. And then the other thing that um, a text must have um, is generic coherence, or that's what we've just looked at, um, coherence of genre. That's when we can recognize the text as an example of a particular genre. I when we can identify some sort of schematic structure. And in Halliday's social linguistics, this is at the cultural level. So now we've been looking at the concept of situational uh, coherence. If coherence refers to a paragraph's external contextual properties, right, cohesion refers to the paragraph's internal properties. So I'm, I'm making a distinction now between um, um, coherence and cohesion. So coherence refers to a paragraph's external properties. Cohesion refers to its internal properties. And that's how we'll, I'll spell this out in a bit more detail in a minute. If a text lacks contextual coherence, like the ones we've just been looking at, this will be accompanied by a lack of internal organization as well. Uh, that is the text's cohesion. So lack of contextual coherence is reflected in and is a reflection of its accompanying lack of internal organization, i.e. its lack of cohesion. Now recall, recalling that highfalutin sounding notion, um, implicative sequentialness, a few slides back. The key idea in cohesion is that there is a semantic tie between an item at one point in a text and an item at another point, remember? And here's a quote um, by Halliday and Hassan, which really sums it up beautifully. Cohesion occurs, I'll let you read it. Okay, so here's a piece of non-text, an example taken from Susan Eggins's book, An Introduction to Systemic Functional Linguistics. Notice that she's numbered the clauses, but the text is to be read as one piece. Well, obviously, it's a non-text. But I want us to pay specific attention to a couple of things. First, it's lexical selection. Notice that the kinds of activities change from clause to clause. From white mice and time in one, we move to the weather in two. Races starting in three, we don't know what four is about. And cookery in five, okay. Now let's pay attention to the participants involved. So here we can see that tiptoe gets introduced but is never referred to again. In sentence two, the participant is Paris. The participant race is also new and presented as though we knew which one, but no prior mention has been made of it. Um, and what is it and so of sentence four? Not only then is there no coherence in this text, but also there is no lexical cohesion. 
So, have a go at an analysing this text also from Susan Egan's book. It does have some aspects of texture. In particular, there are lexical links between words in different clauses. The word cheese in clause one is repeated in clause two, uh, and is one type of the dairy products mentioned in three. Similarly, dairy products links with milk, and calcium links with vitamin deficiencies. Thus, there is a level of cohesion here, but the participants mentioned still keep changing you know, from mouse to the French to milk. So, well, it, it also, it, you know, it lacks situational coher coherence, doesn't it? I mean, we, we can't determine the field of this text or what genre it belongs to. Each clause seems to be drawn from a different genre. Now, this one is interesting because it has some texture. Michael took the book out of the glove compartment and gave it to Jane. He had a terrible smell about it. He coughed and said, thanks. She asked if it was pretty. Together they cooked. So it has some limited internal cohesion here. The it of sentence two refers to the book. The he of three is Michael. The she of four refers to Jane in one. And the together of five refers to the same Michael and Jane. And, uh, you know, we can represent these cohesive ties in a diagram like this and put the ties in. Um, it makes you appreciate some of the things that have to go on when we read a text, especially one where, for whatever reason, the cohesive ties are hard to retrieve. But going back to this example, um, it's still a bit of a mess. Um, there still is no cohesion in terms of the lexical items. Um, possibly we could say that the text has a recognisable schematic structure. It's a recount. Each clause simply reports uh, the next event in a sequence. But even so, without any lexical cohesion, it's very difficult to construct a text uh, with which um, it's very difficult to construct a context with which the, you know the text is concerned. So, a text with problems, right? Um, the text is apparently a recount, retelling of personal experience. Schematic structure, you can have orientation, clause one, followed by a sequence of events, clauses two through seven. The paragraph has consistency in its lexical items, right? There are links between Paris, sightseeing, the Louvre, and a number of weather terms. Referential cohesion, the I identified in clause one seems to be the same I identified in clause two and, and part of the we in clauses three through seven. So what's wrong with it? Well, logical relations. Uh, the logical relations that we would predict are all messed up. Um, and that's what I want to focus on here. That's the... Um, the, conjun the conjunctions, the words we use to make logical relations explicit, are all wrong. There's a, a problem, in other words, then, with its conjunctive cohesion. It's conjunctive cohesion. So let's look into this notion of conjunctive cohesion. Um, instead of a relation of cause consequence between clauses one and two we're confronted with a concessive relationship however instead of say consequently you can imagine between clauses three and four instead of a relationship of contrast between what we'd hope to do and what we actually could do we actually get a relationship of addition created the word and is used instead of say but unfortunately in clause 5 meanwhile expresses temporal 
simultaneity. Yet there's no, no other action for this one to be simultaneous with. Just as the prior to that in 6 is totally confusing. And finally, instead of the conclusion being introduced as a consequence of prior events, we're confronted with merely with an, an in addition, which is weird. Instead of say, I don't know, so you could imagine, or all in all, something like that. Okay, so I want to show you, so it's, 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 uh, it has problems with its conjunctive cohesion, clearly. I'm going to show you one more text now, taken from Susan Eggins' book again. Um, this one illustrates uh, one more thing about cohesion, and in, and in a sense it, it sort of pulls all of this cohesion business together. Um, when you read it though, I want you, I want you to ask yourself if it has generic coherence. That you can recognize it's the genre that it's in. Um, referential cohesion, lexical cohesion, and a logical use of conjunctions, like the one we've just like with what we've just been looked at. In other words, it's conjunctive cohesion. So have a look at those four things for this next text. So this has a temporal recount structure, which is not to be confused, uh, which is not confused by the conjunctions this time. So it, 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 I think generically, I'd say it's, it's fine. It has definitely has generic coherence. And you know, there's a consistency of participants. So it has referential cohesion. Um, there is a consistency of lexical choice. So it has lexical cohesion and a logical selection of conjunctions. Uh, it has conjunctive cohesion, I'd say. So what's the problem then this time? Well, basically, no use is made of devices for avoiding retrievable and redundant information. And this is really important because it's, you know, it's tedious to read it as it is when it could be said like this. Clearly, this is much more concise, and um, let's let's analyse the cohesiveness of this text just to kind of pull it all together. Um, referential cohesion, uh, reference ties make the mark of clause one retrievable as the identity of the he in subsequent clauses. Lisa is retrievable for she. Lexical cohesion. Lexical ties link the processes of offering chocolates, taking chocolates, eating chocolates, and so on. Uh, conjunctive cohesion. The logical relations we expect in a recount seem to be observed, with the clauses linked both causally, by the word so, and temporally, by the word then. Omitting and reducing certain lexical items creates ties. Another must be related back to one of the chocolates. So the whole text is much more uh, compact and easier to read. So as the sun slowly sets and the moon rises, we've reached the end of yet another presentation. And again, I hope it's been interesting to reveal aspects of language which usually go unnoticed. The reading materials for this module focus on textual organization at the word and sentence level, syntax. This presentation has focused on texture, which is at the disc discourse level. Anyway, I hope that you can see how important it is for our students to understand language as being intimately related to its context where situational and generic coherence play a role. I think helping students understand a text is partly helping them retrieve the situational context in which any text is embedded. So helping to contextualize the language in the classroom is a you know, big, big responsibility for us teachers, I think. Um, also, helping students make links between the parts of the text is important. The language resources of cohesive ties 
referential lexical and conjunctive can be used in ways that make the text difficult to understand or easy to understand. Um, so modelling for students how to, here's the nice way to put it I think, dance around in the text, dance around in the text. That is, take the trouble to notice how the text is tied together. That can be a really invaluable thing to teach our students I think. Well, all right. It's been a pleasure making these presentations. I've never done anything like this before, and I'm sure I've made lots of mistakes and could have done things better. But I hope that collectively these have been um, helpful, um, perhaps making clear a particular linguistic theme or sparking an interest in an unseen aspect of language. I've really enjoyed making them anyway. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you and I hope to see you soon and not just in cyberspace either. So, take care.